Hello, everybody. Mm. Hola. <laughs> Darina is here. She's uh, her internet is uh, very spotty out there in Tao. So um, she's gonna for this at this point she's gonna be just a voice. Um, we'll guide us in our meditation today. It's good to see you all. Of course, as always, take a take a look around. See who's here with us today. This afternoon, this evening. Maybe this morning for some folks here, I don't know. Uh, Michelle and I are in Santa Fe, New Mexico right now, getting ready to teach a retreat up at Vallecito starting tomorrow. So I know there are, um, ah, yes, hold on. Um, there are some other yogis who won't be here because they're coming to our retreat. They're traveling as well. And then uh, for the next couple of weeks, it'll be Darine and Steve and maybe Jake. Um, holding the space for the, the Sunday sittings. Hmm. Well, it's wonderful to be here with you all. And yeah, Darine, whenever you're ready, you can take us away. Thank you. It's lovely to see you. And uh, just slowly, um, you can start closing your eyes, taking your time to land inside your body, perhaps a few deep breaths. Landing in your pelvis area, your seat bones, the feet, bottom of the feet, touching, and perhaps the whole body sitting, a global awareness of the whole body. Just check your whole posture, making any adjustment. And finding that balance between relaxation and energy. Perhaps starting to receive sounds just as they are happening. And if the mind is wandering, Perhaps just great appreciation when mindfulness is back. And returning to receive sounds, vibrations, coming and going by themselves. Finding a deeper calm and relaxation.
perhaps feeling the sensations in the hands and just a little small part in the hands whatever is most obvious or any other part in the body receiving directly warmth or numbness light tingling or perhaps any um, emotions too in the heart mind mind states boredom joy clarity sleepiness foggy mind whatever is appearing see if you can just if there is any um, acceptance just as they are appearing without wanting to change or manipulate nature the movement of the breath deep shallow And see if you can connect, your attention can connect and sustain with the beginning, middle, end of whatever is appearing, whatever the attention is. And as the attention is connecting with experience, noticing the quality of, of awareness, perhaps inviting some tenderness and care. appreciating for whatever is arising sustaining and disappearing whether they are pleasant sensations emotions thoughts unpleasant or neither pleasant and unpleasant nor unpleasant just letting phenomena follow its own course without interfering and trying to get something you can breathe something. Um, attention can be open up and move. with the flow of sense experience of smelling and then touch or thoughts tasting thoughts emotions
moment by moment. Sometimes anchoring the attention in a small area is a skillful thing to do. With care, interest, kind. Appreciation. Allowing experience to be just as it is.
Tangendari ini. Just take a quick look again through. I um, will offer a short talk today. I, I realize there's in some ways it seems like a lot of our talks, maybe forever, <laughs> certainly recently, and certainly I think for the last couple of years, there's a lot of um, just kind of how do we manage in our practice the, the realities uh, of the world we're living in, you know, some of the challenges that we uh, face, you know, personally or collectively, you know, in the world uh, right now. And, and just the ways I think in which that the intensity around so much of that has become so heightened. Um, and, um, I think for me, there's been something very kind of powerful happening um, in my kind of managing of this, of, of as someone who really, um, on one hand, I, I really do believe in, um, you know, our tradition, the, the monks and nuns and lay people who uh, go off into caves and, and practice in solitude for many years. Um, I really do believe in the validity of that and the, the beauty and the power of that and um, really recognize that, you know, if, if there hadn't been people doing that over the millennium, you know, that these teachings wouldn't have been preserved in the same way, that there's something about that approach that really is um, making the conscious decision to distance from you know, the society way of life and the news of the world and, you know, uh, how it's talked about in the suttas and stuff of, you know, the, the kings and the queens and the villages and, and gossip and um, there's something very beautiful about that and important. And at the same time, I think that it's not the only way to practice and that that actually, unless we're really that secluded, <laughs> which very few of us are, especially if you're on Zoom right now, uh, the, that I do think it's actually important and that there is a responsibility to, to know about the world and to understand as best we can what's, you know, what's happening in the world right now and the beautiful things and the inspiring things and the painful things and the horrific things. And, and that there is a value in understanding, you know, their nature, where they come from, um, trying to be a part of their, um, you know, upholding that which is good and, and trying to transform that which is harmful and painful in the world. And, and that requires education, it requires knowledge um, and knowing, it requires like ideas and, you know, theories and concepts and um, things that really are part of this sphere of our experience around conventional truths that are really distinct um, in many ways from our relationship to ultimate truths, right? The, the ultimate truths of the mind, of uh, you know, mind and, and knowing of, of the mental factors and you know, concomitants as they're called, right? That, that arise with knowing um, all the, the qualities of mental experience and all the qualities of physical experience, these things that can be directly known, right? The, the basic um, knowable phenomena of, of existence, of experience, and um, Nibbana also included in that, the unconditioned truth. Um, you know, that these are the, the ultimate truths are not only like the deep insight truths it's it's just the truths of the, the phenomena that we can directly observe in the heart and mind and then there's the world of conventional views and truths and 
perspectives and opinions and stories and and all of that and um this this dance then as people who are of of both worlds right that that we recognize in this practice the power transformative power and the importance and the validity of of really uh you know coming into relationship with um these ultimate truths of our experience and reconciling uh through them you know our liberation um but then what is our relationship to the more conventional truths of of our own lives of our own stories and, and of the world around us and um i've noticed a uh a more like a greater sensitivity to the pain of knowing uh in myself recently uh a, a sense of uh as someone who likes to know in the conventional way um and has some like kind of training and capacity for that and you know rigorous educational experiences that um supported that and um help that kind of flourish and then the sort of the limits of that and the limits of that not just the limits of that kind of knowing but the ways in which that kind of knowing can start to create the conditions under which i have a harder time being in relationship and knowing the more ultimate truths and being in relationship with the mind body um ultimate realities um in a way that's that it really ultimately has become my my uh, deeper concern and so i uh you know it's, it's it's uh some of it's sort of funny the way it kind of plays out i, I you know where where um i live in hawaii there's really no like bookstores uh there is a little bookstore down in kona which is like an hour away and actually it's even further it's in the southern end of things so it's and it's i don't go there as a destination it's like i happen to maybe be in that area for something and pop in and it's it's cute it's okay but it's um it's not like necessarily satisfying for um the sort of deeper thirst of that kind of experience you know like going to a great bookstore and so it was interesting the other day coming here to santa fe and um, there's a great bookstore here in town and, um going in and um I haven't had this, I don't know that I've had this experience in the same way ever, but of, um, of finding it like really oppressive, the sense of just being surrounded by all this sort of fixed knowing, right? Everything written down as this sort of little boxes of, of knowledge and of certainty, um, whether it's stories or perspectives or views and um, opinions of history and reality and um, it, it just felt like a prison. It felt very oppressive, um, given maybe what's sort of been happening so much in the world of like reading the news and, and getting so inundated with the, the way things are and the knowing of, of what's happening. Um, this sense of like, oh, not finding the joy in literature or in all of the different kinds of knowing that are possible and that you encounter in a bookstore, but really actually kind of like feeling like I needed to kind of protect myself from it, that I needed to kind of like actually kind of turn more inward um and i can only deal with like the art section i realized it's like i can kind of go into like others oh, like pictures <laughs> and paintings and um maybe stuff about music and this this very powerful dance of like certain things are on music i could kind of like check out but it got to biography and it just it again it felt too fixed and too firm and too um locked too stuck too certain too dead you know that there was something about the way in which knowledge gets um, concretized that um, it was amazing to me the way in which it was like oh i felt um so confined by it and the way that I feel like my mind has really needed to be really less conceptual and like just looking at a log, you know, or a chair 
not just or something of course beautiful in nature you know staring out at something gorgeous of course if that's possible but the 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 need to just like stare at something and not process it right not consider it in the intellectual way but just to acknowledge it and to to really uh, be with things in a different way to allow it to be itself without my putting itself and in, putting it into a prison right or putting myself into a prison in the way that we're imprisoning all of the world in the way that we just kind of lock everything down in concept and knowing and identification and perspective and views um, the goodness and the badness and all of that of everything around us and of course you know that as i will say and have said many times it's not that there isn't a role or a place for that in our lives um, but i can see that there's this very particular dance um, that i'm in right now and i think that many of us as in terms of you know talking to to people the students uh, to whoever of of just how much can we take of the knowing right and of reading the news and of um uh, uh reading whatever we read right in terms of creating more internal structures in which we um put everything in and so that we come to understand everything and um that through this understanding that there's some sort of sense of security and we take in new bits of information and we either reject it and argue against it or maybe we incorporate it into what we already believe and it agrees easily or maybe we shift a little bit of our perspective but this, this way that that process this negotiation of, of new inputs and views and perspectives of how we're holding everything um, the pain of that the the exhaustion of that the um The fact that it needs to keep getting reasserted and reasserted and reasserted if it's going to build that sense of structure internally or externally, right? That we feel safe in, we feel comfortable in knowing this is the way it is, even if it's awful or even if it's wonderful. That there's a sense that um, the 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 structure of knowledge is how we create security. Um, for ourselves in a world that's always changing, that's undependable, that's unpredictable. And how, you know, it's like, okay, this is a, a natural process, it's important to many levels, and yet where are the places that we find relief from that, where we're, we're not putting ourselves into that? And Santa Fe is like a cool town in that way also, just like there's all this art and like random weird sculptures around that are very hard to like pin down and to you know, like a little wind wheels, you know, that are whimsical and uh, playful and beautiful. Um, you know, the, uh, this idea of a place that, yeah, uh, values public art and the relief that that can provide, you know, of something more abstract, of, of less discernible, less, um, of less clear meaning and how important actually that is. Um, I think for humans in general, <laughs> and you go through these waves, you know, throughout time where maybe ideas and, and ways of knowing there was, you know, more and more sort of rigidity and structure and, and tightness and then kind of more of explosion of that and letting go of that or rejecting of that and more abstraction and, um, and find that it's like reading poetry now um, is much easier for me than um other forms of literature but also it needs to be poetry that like i don't necessarily understand that well that that isn't that clear in terms of what it means the the poetry that i read that feels more like obvious you know of a oh, this is saying this um it, again starts to have that like mm, uh limiting um frozen sort of architectural uh, confining quality to it or with music you know a sense of more listening to more music that doesn't have words or is in uh, languages that I don't understand um, or if it's in languages I understand that it's you know more abstract you know in terms of what the content is feeling like the relief of that for the mind of the not needing to um, 
you know, solidify it into anything particular in particular kinds of knowing and knowledge. Um, and then of course, seeing that that can be a, a path to uh, another kind of kind of enchantment, you know, with, with uh, the beautiful, with the abstract, with the weird, with the, um, it can, it doesn't, that doesn't necessarily lead to uh, the kind of attention of mindfulness, of disenchantment, of unhooking, right, of liberation in the context that we're talking of. Um, but it does, it can help, I think, in some ways, loosen, you know, some of the um, tension that can be around trying to know things in certain ways. And I do want to make it like clear the distinction between what I think I'm talking about and like delusion, <laughs> because delusion is also like a very effective tool for not feeling the intensity of reality, right? It's a way of kind of uh, averting the attention away from that which is maybe unpleasant or pleasant in a way that feels uncomfortable um, or not wanting to see the heart's entanglement in various things. Um, so there is like a difference between um, getting so involved in, in thinking about and conceptualizing and kind of knowing and in views um, about whatever and the sort of rejection of that through delusion of simply not of ignoring, right? Of ignoring the world or ignoring what's happening internally or externally um, as a, a choice or as a habit, um, though as, a, as still distinct, I think, from the sense of how do we get space from the fixedness and the solidity of our um, kind of common ways of knowing and allow ourselves into the, the possibility of knowing in a different way. And, um, and of course, the, the deepest ways of that are around Vipassana and around, you know, knowing things on their own terms outside of concept, non-manipulated experience of, of the heart, mind, and body, of, of the truth that we come to understand through that. Um, but it's also hard, you know, it's also very hard to do internally. If we have a, a tendency to do that externally, there's going to be a tendency to do it internally. It's one of the tricky things about um, even our practice of mental noting, where we sit down, you know, we observe the body, we observe the breath, we observe the mind, and there's this incredible tool of mental noting, of, of a, adding a very subtle, gentle label to arising, falling, pressure, tension, thinking, planning, wanting, you know, th that these are it is such a helpful tool of a kind of knowing of what's happening in order to keep in connection with it, right? In order to, to not just get distracted and to not ignore it and to start to see the precision with which we can observe what's happening in the mind and in the body. Um, but like, you know, many of you, and if not all of you who have you know, practice in some way or the more formal practices of that or, you know, the Mahasi um, method and tradition, you know, there you get to points where it feels oppressive, where very similarly, it's just like, oh, the knowing feels extra, the, the, the knowing in that way, and that there is a way of knowing that is wordless, that is not, that is even less conceptual, that sort of takes out a little bit of that tool and the method. And, um, how powerful and how beautiful it can be to practice without that sort of structure, without the method. Um, but also the reason we have it is because we start to see that without any structure, without any method, without any approach, that it's very hard to observe and that the mind will tend to go into its patterns of behavior of greed, hatred, and delusion in ways that are um, not as easily visible. And so, um, you know, like we always really encourage that even when we let go of the, the noting process at times, that we don't think that we've sort of like somehow superseded it forever, or that we've um, uh, 
that it's a lesser way of practicing, but to realize that there are times where it's very valuable, where the tool of it is essential. Um, and then there's times where we also, it is important to experience the mind and the body outside of those frameworks. But a lot of it will have to do with, with seeing that it's, um, and it's a paradox that as we let go of those things and we try to observe the mind really without manipulation, observe the body really without manipulation, that it actually becomes less familiar, that it becomes stranger, um, that it becomes less coherent for certain periods of time um, and sometimes more frightening. And there is a place of recognizing then why we, it, it's important to see that at times because we can see why the conceptualizing of things and the know, knowledging of things, the knowing of things uh, is, is, is such a deep habit pattern for us. So much of it comes out of fear, right? Out of, out of the sense of insecurity with how wild reality really is and that the that it's amazing that the mind has this ability to solidify things and to concretize things and to um, manage to make this wilderness of constant change manageable um, and unfortunately that it mostly does that through stress <laughs> and through craving and through aversion and through ignorance and delusion um, as as tools of solidifying that which is always changing and so to recognize like that in some ways we might want to be free from the fixedness and the tightness and the the tension the dukkha of the mind that is um, part of this process the part of the the result of the process of of knowing in this very fixed way um, but that also to see how it's serving us, right? To really appreciate the way in which if you start to really let go of controlling the mind and observe the flood of mental fabrication in terms of thought, in terms of images and imagination, um, that it is very weird, right? And it's very abstract. It's very um, surreal. Um, and that the body can feel very surreal as well, right? That that you come to, we, we can find our familiar ways of, oh, this is pressure and this is tension and this is warmth and this is, you know, earth element or fire element and to really value the structure of that. And then there are sensations and the more we look, the greater terrain they might um, represent that don't easily fit into the categories, right? Or, or that the categorizing of them is... A, kind of painful experience of the mind. And so in sort of letting it go of that requires allowing things to be, um, allowing everything that we think of as ourselves to sort of stand in opposition to us and to be foreign and strange and unfamiliar. Um, and yes, there might be times where that's like enchanting, but there might also be times where that's disturbing. and ultimately the sense of where are the times where that's also like where we can be at peace with that, where there's uh, an ease with that, where there's an equanimity with that, with the way things are and the constant flux. It's, um, it's quite beautiful uh, and, it's, and it's quite powerful, but it's also something to be careful with, right? And, and to understand and to not give our minds a hard time for all of the ways that they're trying to keep it all together because it doesn't always feel capable of that degree of kind of disillusion uh, or, or abiding in that degree of kind of like abstraction of experience. And I, I you know, I, don't, I know how, um, And, and I think there's something important there of like things don't need to make sense for them to be okay. And in, in this sort of deeper quality of equanimity that, that there might be experiences where there is an understanding of how things that otherwise don't make sense might make sense, you know, 
uh, as we practice uh, tensions, uh, contradictions in the world or in ourselves that are, you know, some schools of Buddhism are very focused on kind of like wrestling with these paradoxes, right? Or koans and things where things don't, aren't ever going to make sense and that the resolution doesn't come through the resolving of the paradox, um, uh, but of the resolving the heart around them. Um, and, you know, these things are, are ultimately true also for even in this tradition of practice, though it might not always take the same form. I, um, it's just, you know, one of the things, of course, you see a lot these days and we talk about it every so often is, um, you know, people using more, um, the ways in which like psychedelics have become more into like the mainstream in terms of uh, psychiatry, in terms of therapy and kind of all sort of therapeutic um, uses. And, um, you know, I won't go into the whole treaties about it, but of course there's wonderful things about people being helped, people who are suffering, finding help. Um, there's complicated things of taking like ancient wisdom medicines out of their context and putting them in like a Western medical context and charging money for it. And so that's like number one complication thing. And then there's, um, I think this question of kind of where it fits into our world. And I, I can only say that there's, as I was sort of thinking about this talk, I, there's something that I've remembered about this sort of, this question of knowing. Um, I think I, maybe I saw a preview for uh, Michael Pollan, you know, his book is now a show and, um, about people, you know, using uh, psychedelics and stuff for therapeutic reasons. And, um, you know, so I, in, my, in my limited experience with, um, psychedelics that is now coming on like a long time ago. <laughs> I remember one experience uh, where I ha um, had taken some mushrooms and this, it's like after all these years this thing sits with me of like I was looking I was like there was a sense of how my shoe and like the moon and like the universe like just made sense right there was like there was this way in which it was like it all it made sense. And there was this incredible like relief in that experience of it um, making sense. And I couldn't have like threaded it together of like how those things made sense. Um, but it was very compelling, uh, this feeling of like, oh, it all makes sense. <laughs> and um, I'm really not sure how like useful that has been in my life. Um, you know, moving on from, from that moment. And I really do see that as very distinct, actually, from the experience of equanimity that occurs in our practice, where this, it, it's like the, the concern with things making sense is actually not as fundamental, right? There is, especially in, like, after the Buddha you know, of, of the Abhidhamma and Buddha psychology, um, you know, the people came in, I mean, there's a traditional story of what that is, and then there's a sort of historical narrative, which is to say that people came up with these structures and these frameworks of like, oh, here's what every moment of consciousness is happening with eye consciousness and ear consciousness and, the, you know, contact and all of the you know, the mental concomitants, the concomitants that are coming together to do this and, and the sense of making sense of being. Um, but you don't see that as much really in the sutta, um, the suttanta methods, as they say, right? The, the, the teachings of the Buddha directly and the practice of, of, of Vipassana directly. There is not a lot of sense of that it's important to figure it out, to have it make sense. There is a an essential value in observing it actually outside of the conceptual on its own terms of observing the that which is so hard to see and to see that there is um, there are truths about the nature of existence that become clear right that become evident and these truths are put down in words in scripture and in text and in our talks but that they don't happen in words. 
The insight doesn't happen in words. It doesn't happen in concept. It's a different quality of knowledge, of relationship, of understanding, of the nature of phenomena, uh, of, of the nature of suffering, of whatever they might be. I mean, any words you start to kind of add on to it start to be dicey in terms of their validity. Um, and that the equanimity, you know, at the heart of realization and the peace that comes through um, the understanding, right, the, the wisdom understanding, not the knowledge understanding, is um, really entirely different than some of these other experiences that can be very powerful and very profound um, and may have qualities, of course, that are resonant in terms of mind states and, and mental states. Um, but that purity of simply being with the truth of things and that that truth not having uh, very much content to it, not having words, not having concepts, not having labels. Um, yes, of course, we talk about impermanence. We talk about undependability. We talk about non-self. Um, but even all of those things, if you look at them, are pointing towards something that's very ephemeral, very uh, ethereal. Um, and that it's this sort of, it's that quality of the truth of things, um, the slipperiness, the, the undefinability of phenomena, ultimately, um, that is such an important doorway for our practice and for our liberation. And so to be really, I'll just to, <laughs> to say, you know, this sense of like, to be somewhat vigilant about that in our lives um, and in our practice of, of what is the role that's being played of um, conceptual knowledge? And are we being careful of that? Are we being thoughtful about how we're bringing in, uh, you know, conventional knowledge into our lives and into our practice? Where are we um, dedicated to uh, the experience and the exploration and the relationship with um, these ultimate realities of mind and body, um, of that which is directly experienceable? And I think it's always important to ask this question. It's like, is this our baseline? Is it is like our baseline the experience of ultimate truth? And then we come and sort of dabble in conventional truth because we we know we have to and it's functional and there's like goodness in that and it helps put our other truths into uh, um, some kind of functional process in the world. Uh, or are we really living in conventional truths and sort of how to take vacations into the ultimate truths and and have the the ultimate truths sort of be something that you know helps kind of purify and uh, inform our conventional minds and lives and experience and i'd say for very few of us is that always one or the other but it's it's worth trying to be honest about with ourselves at any given period of our lives right um when you're a yogi um, you know, in terms of like, well, really on retreat and in intensive periods of intensive practice, when you're in your daily life, when different things are happening in your lives and we're more caught up or we're less caught up or things in our lives might be feel more grounded or more quiet. Um, or other times we're on retreat and we feel like we're totally in our conceptual conventional lives and we're like, not at all feeling like we're being very good yogis. Uh, it's not to say that we can always measure it. But it's a worthwhile question, I think, for all of us to be asking. It's like, where is our home? And where are we visiting? And what is our deeper commitment? And what is simply a matter of skillful means? Um, and there is a right answer. <laughs> but I, mean, I, I think that, um, you know, there is a right answer. In terms of the Dhamma, absolutely. And there is not a right or wrong answer in terms of self-judgment, in terms of that there are times in our lives where we just really, in order to survive, in order to 
attend to the things we need to attend to in the world that we really need to be very invested and involved in the world and in conceptual frameworks and realities and and working on that level and and to not um disregard it to not um to really understand that it's it is part of our lives that there's a value to it and um there's times where actually we might start to see that it provides a haven for us from what might start to feel scary from the uncontrollability and the wilderness of the of the truth um but it's an important question to i think you know to to always check in with you know and to to just be it's like oh really right now i feel like i feel so dedicated to the dhamma and so dedicated to liberation and insight and and how beautiful a feeling that is you know and then how painful sometimes it can be to feel like okay we need to we still need to be dealing on these other terms at times and there might even be things that's that are good for us in that right in terms of balance um and then the other times to really recognize as we're like wow i am like just very involved in um you know anchoring in the conventional truth world and to try to understand why and to see and and to make sure that at the very least we don't totally lose connection right that we still have our daily practice or our weekly practice or coming on retreat or you're reading dhamma or whatever it is that's or that you're just spacing out staring at a chair once in a while right or like finding some way of getting out of this tendency to lock everything into knowing in this um very painful way that we and painful and beautiful and wonderful way that we all have more training in than the training to observe things just as they are and so just knowing that it's like this other way is always available right that it actually takes no effort to stop and to just observe something externally or internally on its own terms for a few moments for a few breaths and then seeing of course that it starts to get complicated you know most things will get start you know you you start practicing and then it starts to be complicated and it's ways that it can get complicated but to realize that like actually these things are don't have to be so far from each other right the the ultimate realities the conventional realities that um they're just one moment to the next and we don't have to feel like we've totally lost the thread one way or the other you know that it's a lot of what we teach when people are on retreat and they're just starting to feel like it's too much and it's too intense and they feel disoriented it's like read a book get concrete get normal but to see how quickly we can come back to like our ourselves quote unquote right and be normal again and important to be able to know that we can work that muscle but that the opposite muscle is also true that you can be sort of normal and conventional and blah, 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 and, and and turn into this other mode you know at the uh you know, there's little phrases that are mixing in my head the turn of a hat the flip of a dime something like that uh that are um you know just easily accessible in any moment and to not lose the um the sense of power in that I will I'll close with a poem um and I'll read it I'll first I'll read it in Spanish and then um in English to help if, if you don't speak Spanish then you can not have to worry about what it means because you'll find out <clears throat> It's Antonio Machado a uh, uh, Spanish poet from turn of the last century La tarde caía triste y polvorienta It's called la noria sorry uh, the water wheel El agua cantaba su copla plebia en los cajilones de la noria lenta Soñaba la mula pobre mula vieja al compás de sombra que en el agua suena la tarde caía triste y polvorienta yo no sé qué noble divino poeta unió la amargura de la eterna rueda 
la dulce armonía del agua que sueña. Y vendó tus ojos, pobre mula vieja. Mas sé que fue un noble, divino, divino poeta, corazón maduro, de sombra, de sombra y de ciencia. The Water Wheel Evening fell, sad and dusty. The water sang its plebeian ballad in the ceramic jugs of the slow water wheel. The mule dreamed, poor old mule, of the shaded spaces in which the water sounded. Evening fell, sad and dusty. I don't know what noble, divine poet joined the bitterness of the eternal wheel with the sweet harmony of the dreaming water and covered your eyes, poor old mule. But I know it must have been a noble, divine poet, heart matured by shadow and knowledge. And I think there's something in this that so encompasses like this, this, you know, being able to observe this mule turning this water wheel and and this, you know, this question, I don't know what noble divine poet joined the bitterness of the eternal wheel with the sweet harmony of the dreaming water, right? This beautiful sound of the wheel, the water, you know, falling into its jugs. Um, but it must have been some, you know, divine, noble poet. And so it's it's that dance where it's like, you know, the arts and the enchantment of the arts, of course, it goes exactly into what the Buddha said of, uh, Mis <laughs> misinterpretation that like this is how we come up with the idea of a god or someone must have created this right rather than simply um, observing the direct phenomena and yet there is something in the kind of poet's vision and the poet's sensitivity to the world of of understanding like the tension at the heart of of what is bringing these two the sort of the beauty of the sweetness of the sound and the agony of this kind of relentless dreary work of the mule. Uh, how are these things, these two things come together? And how hard is that for the heart to understand? Um, that is so, I feel like essential for us as yogis to be able to, to get sensitive enough to the world around us, to, to feel these tensions in our heart, the beauty and the sadness and the, the grief and, the, and that these things are, are so, why are they that they come together, right? That they're 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 part often of the same process of of or at least dynamically related processes. And how do we appreciate the beauty, appreciate the sadness, um, and find that connection with it? Um, but then perhaps without needing to conjure up a divine noble poet who is in charge of all of it, but actually going deeper with it into the the land of insight and equanimity, coming to terms with it on that way, rather than having to succumb to the tendency of more concept, right? More knowing, more frameworks in order to reconcile it in our hearts. And so it looks like we have lost Darine in her uh, voice as well <laughs> but um we do have some time if anyone has any questions uh about your uh practice uh about the instructions about the talk um happy to to take some time for that Hey, Kelly. Let's see, I think you can unmute. I'm going to try. Yeah. Hi, can you hear me? 
Mm -hmm. cool. um, thank you for the talk. Good to see everyone. Um, I've been thinking a lot recently about entertainment, entertainment in my life. A lot of, you know, a lot of it around the various technologies that allow for entertainment, but also entertainment through things that aren't on my phone or computer. And um, I've been sort of working through relationships with those things over many months now. And periodically throughout the sort of process of trying to come to um, more in balance with these things and often getting to a space where like abstinence is really the best for my mind state and what these things tend to do to it. And I keep remembering, um, I don't know if it's a precept or, or how it works, but that like monks, they participate in no forms of entertainment and uh, that feels quite extreme. And I'm not trying to be a monk in sort of my day to day, but just very curious about I don't know, I guess making sense of where entertainment fits given that I'm not in a monastery and that feels like an extreme choice. And so I don't know if you have any thoughts on on that. Or anything. Yeah, and, and actually first, just like when you got to that sentence of that actually like abstinence feels like the healthiest option for you. I mean, can you say more about just sort of, yeah, what did that, what helped, what made that clear and how has that, how does it go when that's, Kind of operating um i feel like that's resulted like it's it's interesting it feels similar to a lot of the um coming to certain understandings in the practice where there's like a back and forth of fighting with something and trying to make it work within you know moderation and having my schemes about this is how i'm going to do things and trying to understand it um and this then just coming to a point of kind of that feeling of disillusionment about it. It really seems to affect my mind. It's hard to sort of have distance. It, it generates more of this kind of like craving. It just builds on that where it feels like then I wanna just feed it more and more with more entertainment and realize in the moments when I'm stepping away and getting space, um, I just feel far calmer and freer and relaxed and um so trying to make it work and trying to keep things in my life but then coming to the point where it's like okay it's just not working that way and i feel better if i'm just staying away so yeah i mean it sounds great and it sounds like you're in some ways you've you're figuring it out <laughs> and that you're 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 coming to understand something very powerful about these kind of habits and tendencies that we have to to entertain the mind and and where is that feeling like it's joyful and provides relief and where does it feel like it's a sense of kind of like connecting us to culture and to other people and where does it feel like it becomes something that actually is like disconnecting us from ourselves or from the the mind spaces that we know are available to us and the kind of heart qualities that start to feel threatened by it. I'm, I think it's just kind of exactly what you're saying. It's like that exploration is so fruitful and the exploration is much more important. The willingness to explore it and the willingness to try different things and to be I, I don't, it's like, I, I think the word discipline isn't always helpful, right? Or disciplined or determined or inquisitive about it, right? Is, um, I mean, that's, that's much more important than, than I think what the traditional form of like what you'd call discipline might mean, right? Or saying, I'm going to exit all out, or I'm only going to live this way. Like the, the idea of like making a big decision that is everlasting or like a, you're going on a fast or something like that. Um, you know, not to say that those things can't be very powerful, right, or to make a kind of commitment around something. Um, but the learning, I would say, is the most important part, you know, and that 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 you're engaged right now in a process of of sensitivity and 
willingness to change and explore and recognize what's hard about it and what's really fruitful about it is definitely the most important thing. Absolutely. Yeah. The, you know, the, the, the Vinya rules, you know, for monks and nuns are, you know, pretty clear around, you know, sort of like not, not going to shows or entertaining for sort of exuberance or, um, you know, all of, all of that stuff. And it's exactly what you're saying. I mean, it's just that it's a sense of, um, that we, that sense of preferring the quietude of your mind and the sense that like, oh, you, you can actually manage the mind in this way. And that there's like a, a purity and a, a kind of cleanness and a, and a spaciousness there that can get overwhelmed when we get really sort of caught up and are absorbed in, in other stuff. Um, which isn't to say one, you like, you know, you go around Burma and you'll see, I've seen plenty of monks at like karaoke bars, like, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> you know, so it's like, it's definitely not like there's the, everyone's following these rules in the same way. You know, there's a huge range in terms of how, even in a monastic world, people are relating to these like, you know, precepts and, and the rules that are going in. And I think it's, 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 it's kind of, if you're like a real purist or, or you have a sort of fantasy of like, oh, this is what monks in this place or nuns in this place should, should be like, and then you sort of see the reality of what it's, it's important to see that it's, it's, it's very hard to basically, part of what you're then saying is that you're not a cultural person, <laughs> right? And that that's like a very intense kind of renunciation. Um, and so I think that like, while you're in the space of exploring what it's like to let things go and seeing the value of for yourself of like knowing how hard it is to be like um uh in a middle ground with it right that it's sort of like we either get like totally caught up in it or just kind of like put it away that it's very hard um to be in a middle space with it to recognize like oh what is the value of this kind of renunciation as it feels good right and i'd say that for for all of us on, you know, sort of our teaching team, we really also like recognize that we are, like you're saying, we're, most of us are not really renunciates at that level, that we're not living that kind of austerity and sort of distance from, um, we, and we don't have the other protections around us that course so-called entertainment are actually helping us with, right? That it's like, we're not in a place where we don't have to work and we're just getting our, you know, donors are coming and giving us food every day and you're protected by the sort of like sangha around you. And there's like so much energy of people meditating and being quiet and being careful and everyone's whispering. And, you know, it's like, actually you're living in a world where it's like, you have a job and you have to cook for yourself and you have like people you're arguing with and people that are difficult and people that are wonderful and you have your family and like, you're actually, we're, we're managing things in our lives in which, there are places where listening to some music, watching a movie, uh, reading a book, like, and, and being involved in our, you know, cultural realities can be of great benefit too, you know, and um, can be joyful and can be, um, help us feel a sense of connection. And I think they are out, like you're talking about like something that is like so profound about all of society right now, Plenty of people who don't practice are getting this question of like how alienating uh, social media is, right? And the like, how crazy it makes us and how unsatisfying it is on some deep level. And then, but it's still compelling and all of this stuff, you know, so that like, that you're willing to be sensitive with it and, and find a place of boundary and find a place of exploration. It's like, the exploration is always going to be more important than kind of like the, the final decision of this is how you are around social media or this is how you are around movies or music or, or what have you, you know? Um, I don't know. How does that, how does that sound? <laughs> yeah, that sounds good. I, yeah, I think, yeah, having asked the question, I think that the major thing was getting to this, this place of feeling like I've, I've, had a common path through a couple of different forms of entertainment and get to the same place at the end and getting mm. to this question of like 
should I just be not engaging in any form of entertainment, like across the board, but that feeling quite extreme. So the, the point about the, the exploration of it being the key um, makes a lot of sense, sort of rather than just trying to come down with some generalized rule. So, yeah. Yeah, and I think, I mean, you just also have this, it's a great example of going from like, the sense of it feels good to be quiet. We'll just say that as a way of, but what you're saying around like entertainment. And then the sense of like, what, what kicks in there is a thought around, am I this person who then does this? And is that an extreme thing? And, and how does that put me in? Like, you see this sort of like this level of like kind of conceptualizing around the direct experience and the sense of like, you know, if I would just trust the experience. It's like, if it feels like your mind and heart and body are, are in a place that it's like, you feel like you're in a better relationship with it when you're not distracting yourself, then like, I would trust that, you know? And like, and, and like to be like, oh, is this, this is kind of extreme to like not be doing any entertainment. And it's like, yes, but you're so far beyond that really. It's like you spend 10 days in silence, like not talking to people, like you really, like that's super, really super extreme and it's become something that feels very normal because you're in like a room full of people who are, who do that all the time, you know? So it's like, what's extreme or not starts to become like, uh, not, it's not always the, the parameter by which we can really like evaluate things anymore, you know? And there is that sense of like, oh, wow, it starts to feel extreme of the way that like people are always like entertaining themselves, you know? And like, what is really the more extreme thing, you know? And I think it's a big, you see that in the suttas all the time of like, who's the crazy one here? You know, it's like, we might look like we're crazy because we're sitting here quietly, but like, like there's this sanity that you start to feel like pretty certain about that's in there. And other things start to feel like a little more crazy, you know? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. There's something in, I don't remember if it was Chogyam Trumpa Rinpoche, there's a book, I think it's a book, or it's something of like the sanity that's our birthright, you know, and I think um, and there's something so powerful in that kind of way of, of framing it and phrasing it, and the, the way in which um, this way of life and this this approach to reality um how it can look so extreme from the outside but then from the inside it's like boy the world just really looks extreme and the way in which all of these expressions of it are um sometimes you can feel that sense of that they're all part of the same dynamic whether they're beautiful expressions or the um, really horrible ones, um, and that there's something that we can kind of withdraw from, and that's very powerful. Margo or Richard? You're mm -hmm. Hi. Um, wonderful talk, Jesse. Thank you. Um, it makes me think about 
the difference, the different ways of, of investigation in the you know con, um, consensual reality, the sort of normal world, versus investigation in practice. Um, and I realize that I often approach investigation in practice in the same way I approach investigation <laughs> in, in the so-called real world, right? Um, that is conceptually, intellectually um, trying to make sense <laughs> in that way of, of what the experience is. And when I have been able to, to not do that, I've it's felt like the difference between investigating from outside something versus investigating from inside something. And as I've been thinking about, well, so what's the method of investigation in, in the, the non-conceptual realm? In my experience, it's just it's it's the arising of curiosity is the only method. <laughs> um, and so I'm wondering if you can comment on the method or um, are there techniques or ways of looking at what investigation looks like in the non-conceptual realm? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that that it makes a lot of sense every part you said, and, and also to just appreciate that even the Buddha and also in the commentaries, like there's still plenty of conceptual investigation that's encouraged in in practice, you know, um, that you can see that in any of the descriptions of practice that there's like the kind of bare attention aspect of things, and then there there are things that are just more inquisitive and conceptually and intellectually and um and that there isn't like a tension there in some way I, I think it's like it's understood to be very fluid and i think it's very important to to sometimes have it's like important to, important to see the difference between them but also to not feel like one is therefore inappropriate and one is inappropriate it's like they're they're they all have their place in the process and there's something about cognizing you know that's that's meaningful um but i i think that it's you know it's something that we spend a lot of time trying to language <laughs> and it's not always easy around like how to describe investigation that is not intellectual and so um you know when we're doing the seven factors of awakening or something like that and we talk about that you know investigation as being the second one there is a lot of always a sort of like we find try to find creative ways of, of describing exactly kind of what you're asking. Um, and I think that curiosity is a really important one. Um, and it may, you know, any of these words may work more or less well for any of us. Um, but this sense of, of genuine interest, right, versus manipulative interest, um, not having an agenda. Sometimes it's easier to talk about like, well, what are the other qualities of mind? that are not present um, in terms of the kind of exploration th that we're talking about. I think the other part of it is like persistence. It's a persistent attention. So this sense of like staying with something over time and that the quality of being with, right? The quality of investigation, exploration, curiosity, or just of kind of being with, of presence with, um, but you can also see the way in presence can be, can feel distant or presence can feel more connected and those are gonna have different flavors. But that sense of presence that's persistent, right? That is like maintaining a connection with the sensations of the breath as they're arising, maintaining as it's falling, that there is also something in there, right? That it's, it's a momentary experience that is asserted again and again and again. Um, and that for a long period of time, it needs to be kind of reasserted in order for it to have the impact that investigation can have, right? That, that that relationship can have. So 
So something about, is about it, like the, what is the quality of the moment experience, the momentary experience of, of genuine interest, of curiosity. Um, again, that's not intellectual. It's hard to come up with the right language for it, but also the one that is that is persistent. That's you know, there's the vitaka, the aiming, and the vitara, the sustaining. Um, that a lot of it comes through the sustaining of the attention over time, um, in terms of the quality of the relationship, the quality of the investigation. Um, and I think, again, it's a place, and I don't think this is just like an easy way out, that it is about the exploration, right? Rather than saying, this is, it's, what we mean by investigation in Vipassana is this, ver, ver, and, and not this. Rather than feeling like you're ever going to necessarily get to like the right word for that in English, uh, uh, that's going to therefore settle it, and then you'll know it, and then you'll just be able to do it every time. It's just like, it doesn't work like that, right? And so this idea of like, we'll find our ways to that. And sometimes it's gonna have maybe more of a heart quality to it, a tenderness, right? Sometimes it's the tenderness or the gentleness or the affection of the heart that makes us feel like, oh, that's really connected in a way that is, and sometimes it's cooler than that, right? And there's more equanimity and, you know, there's all kinds of flavors that it might have. The idea is exploring and in this moment, Right, what is the quality, these, um, and it does go back to those ultimate truths, right, of, because it breaks down chittas of, you know, thoughts, to, and uh, chattasikas of, of kind of like mind conditions, mind qualities, that there might be different mind qualities at different times that are at play with the, with the true moment of mindfulness, right, with the true moment of investigation, with the true moment of interest in exploration. And it doesn't always necessarily have to be the exact same formula. Um, but in, in the conditions we're in right now, of you know, this is happening in the sound world, and this is happening in the mind, what are the conditions? What are the qualities uh, that might be able to feel like are connected in this way? And that there might be times where it really is conceptual, where it's like you're needing to talk yourself into being mindful about, oh, like the stuff around anger, right? It was like, I can't be angry at this person because they're just 32 parts of the body and it's just a set of conditions. Or, you know, you have to, you go through these like conceptual deconstructing of this other person that we're angry with. And that's a conceptual process, right? That's encouraged and there's a place for that. And then maybe there's other times where there's just like, oh, a sense of their worthiness, um, a sense of, you know, or a sense of non-separation or whatever it might be. But also getting, you know, it's like not being fussy about what it is in the moment, but being clear of what it is, of being like, oh, here's a little bit of compassion, a little bit of metta, and a little bit of, you know, just aiming and sustaining or whatever it might be. Um, starting to see the different mind states and experiences in the mind that are available, that come together to feel like they might form uh, a moment of, of meaningful connection. I, so I actually, and I muted you. Yeah. yeah. Um, thank you. That's incredibly helpful and, and very beautiful. <laughs> thank you. Mm. Mm. Oh, we've whittled down to the, the Wicharas. <laughs> It is amazing. Every time I come to the mainland, I'm like, wow, I'm always impressed that like, people actually go to the Sunday sit and stay up till more challenging hours than I have to usually stay up for. So um, it expands my sense of appreciation as if it needed it. Yeah. Mm. Uh, wonderful to see everyone Yeah, this week and um, won't see you for a couple weeks. Um, but yeah, Michelle and I will be back uh, <laughs> at some point soon ish um uh, and uh and and steve and darine and and i and probably jake i think will be um holding on the fort for the next couple of weeks so um they'll be happy to see you really wonderful to see you mm. good luck everyone take care of yourselves and each other <laughs>